Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by Faith and for the Faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton. Thank you. McCurdy Haber. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? I am well, Bruce. How are you? I'm all right. You've got a, a weird sort of repeating problem that happens sometimes the very first few seconds of the podcast and then it prepares itself where you're introducing and your and your voice just drops out. So he's David Staples. I'm Bruce McCurdy. We're both with the Cult of Hockey. And by the faithful and for the faithful. Hi, David. So you've seen that that's happened before when you're listening in, you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, voice I, drops I, I, and then, just in the first like twenty seconds of the podcast, and it's not a problem after that. So Goblins, gremlins. Like people that. know what you're saying most of the time because usually we are fairly consistent. Yeah. We're consistent, David. Bruce, 5 3 Oilers victory. Big, biggest, latest, biggest victory of the year. Obviously huge. The Oilers would have, I think, almost no chance of winning the series if they had not split the games in Calgary. And um, it looked like they weren't going to do that tonight, but uh, they did. So we're going to go with two good things each. Two bad things and two numbers. I'm going to start it off, Bruce, because I think my good thing should start it off. <clears throat> okay. And that was the order's resilience. I mean, um, I have to say, if they were catastrophizing as, I, as much as I was during that game, there's no way they would have won. I mean, I was catastrophizing from the moment I woke up today to the orders getting a lead, um, a two-goal lead. And I didn't really stop the whole time. I was losing my mind. So, you know, from, from you know, my worries, like, can Dry Subtle and Nurse, should they even be playing because they're so injured? And we, we got a we got a, an exclamation mark from one of those players on that tonight. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that in a second. Um, to the, the refs calling back two Oilers goals. And, um, you know, the first one in kind of, the first one in crazy fashion, you know, where he just loses sight of the puck, even though it's still loose. And they, it would have been a 2-2 game at that point. And instead they get a, the, the Flames get a power play goal. Um, there's, you know, there's two broken stick goals for the Flames. There's a goal called back. Then McDavid scores to tie it up, and that's called back. It just seems like every break was going against the Oilers. And a, and a less, and a team that was less, mentally tough would have caved at that point um i guess you have to give credit to a number of people everyone on the team but i, I would single out two people connor mcdavid and jay woodcroft woodcroft to, woodcroft's demeanor on the bench was very calm he didn't pull a terry crisp total meltdown <laughs> you know um, he was very calm through that whole process of all those setbacks i thought he was you know i liked the way he was handling it on the bench and um, the players seem also relatively calm, certainly McDavid. And they just he just kept coming and coming and coming until he he got the 3-2 uh, goal. What was the key goal in the game was the 3-2 goal, I think, because it pulls the orders within reach. And he, you know, it was just McDavid doing what Connor McDavid does, what he had done on the previous goal that was called back. Um, you know, um, Duncan Keith finding him in the slot and McDavid just totally making the goalie look like a fool with his incredible deking uh, maneuvers and putting the puck in the net. So that was, that really was, I mean, the orders have plenty of experience for coming back from being down one or two goals in a game. They've mm -hmm. been doing that all year. So there is a feeling when there are down two goals that it's not over for the Oilers. I, I don't have that feeling now when they're down two goals in the first that they're necessarily going to lose. They're used to doing that, and they they falling haven't done behind two nothing in the first. Yes, so yeah, falling behind, and they have come back a few times. Mm -hmm. So it is possible. You know, all things are possible with with Connor McDavid. So, um, and they were again tonight. He 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 was he was he's a big part. Like he, I think he and Woodcroft are the key to this. And uh, <clears throat> maybe they had gray beards. Maybe you know, maybe that's part of it. You know, Mike mm -hmm. Smith. Duncan Keith and some of these older players are also part of that. I mean, it was Keith who made the really nice paths to McDavid on that goal. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, that was, that just stands out more than anything else was the fact that the Oilers didn't give up on this game at any point. They just kept coming 
and it was a dominant in the end I think it really it was a very very encouraging and dominant performance from the Oilers. They had 15 grade A shots to nine for the Flames. They had 10, the subset of five alarm shots, which are the very best scoring chance, chance shots. They had 10. The, the Flames only had five. So that's oh, a nice. anytime you have five or less five alarm shots, I think that's a brilliant defensive effort. And I think we actually saw that from the Oilers tonight after a after a horror show in the uh, first game. They got their defensive game back, and there was the Flames pressed a lot. There was lots of um, grade, like dangerous shots. They're kind of in the grade B variety for the that tested Mike Smith and were had everybody nervous. I'm sure in oil country watching that game, mm-hmm. but they didn't give up the most alarming of the shots, mm-hmm. the five alarm shot, five times. <coughs> so huge for the Oilers in that regard. So that's uh, that's my first good thing. What is your first good thing, Bruce? Uh, I'm going to give the nod to Zach Hyman tonight, who was a dog on the bone on the puck th- throughout this game. I, I just really thought he was uh, uh, all over the puck. Uh, he's one guy who made a, uh, he made a critical mistake early in the game, and I'm going to get into that more with a couple other players where he broke his stick blocking the shot and he made a bad decision to leave the shooting lane to try and get another stick just as the shooting lane turned into the goal scoring lane. That was the first goal of the game. Uh, but he responded to that with a vengeance. And he was he just seemed to be all over the ice, David. And, and, uh, winning battles, skating his ass off. I, I don't think I've ever seen him skate better. I'm pretty <coughs> sure I've never seen him all year skate faster than he did on the shorthanded breakaway where he scored the game-winning goal in the third period, just uh, at a time when it looked like, well, the Oilers made a game of it, but now here's the Flames power play, and, you know, who knows what happens. And yeah. what happens was right away, mm-hmm. uh, Nuge was able to chip a puck to Hyman, and what looked like kind of a, he's going to get out of the zone, was all of a sudden, hey, look, at he's just blazing past everybody. And it was the Calgary D who looked slow there, and... and uh, Hyman just went right in and ripped a shot right over Markstrom's shoulder and under the crossbar to make it four to three. So that certainly was his signature play of the game, the game <clears throat> game winning shorty. Uh, but this in a game where he had uh, 10 shot attempts, six of them on goal, a couple of hits, three block shots, and 23 minutes and 14 <coughs> seconds of ice time. Uh, he bled for his team at one point, and he just... Uh, was uh, you know he was just a a, 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 a a major force in in the game and in the turning of the game in the Oilers' favor and uh, full marks to you Zach Hyman that was your fifth uh, goal of this year's playoffs so that actually matches his entire career total coming into this year with Toronto. Uh, he had one goal in each of five different years. Well, now he's got five goals in one year in Edmonton, so that's kind of nice. You really do need all kinds of different heroes, right, in the playoffs. Yes, absolutely. And and you know we've we've talked about Kane, you know, stepping up. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we've talked about other players stepping up, and Hyman really did. What a fantastic game! What mm-hmm. what incredible effort! From from Zach yeah. Hyman in that game, and you know he had a couple breakaways, and the mm-hmm. first time he got thwarted, right? Yeah. <laughs> when he went to the backhand, yeah. But that second nice. shot could not have been more perfect. It was, you know, it was right over mm-hmm. the big goalie. It's right. a very mm-hmm. small place to sh- shoot, shoot, but mm-hmm. top shelf, right where Mama keeps the cookies, mm-hmm. and he put it right there, like it was uh, the small margin for error, but mm-hmm. he did not err. He found that spot and he put it there. So, um, fantastic. Bruce, my uh, second good thing is Leon Dreisaitl. So, earlier today, I was, and last podcast, I was speculating, like, should they play him? Should they play him in the power play? Should right. they scale back? And um, I, I conducted a poll on this earlier today. And um, so, the, the dominant response was, you know, should, I asked, should the Oilers rest either Darnell Nurse or Leon Dreisaitl? The dominant response from 60% of the Euler fans was rest neither of them, you know. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, 40% yeah. of the fans said one or the other. Yeah. And, and 
you know, so 15% said uh, rest nurse, oh, yeah. 10% said bicycle, and 16% said um, rest both. Wow. So it's a significant minority that who were, it wasn't just me that was, I'm going to say, catastrophizing in this way and thinking about mm -hmm. this issue. I think yeah. it's, so the good thing about this game, Bruce, is as the game went on, and Kevin Bieksa mentioned this, like the, yeah. a, a player with an injury like this, he, his injury will loosen up as the game goes on and play better. Yeah. But Leon Dreisaitl, by the end of this game, he looked mm -hmm. like Leon Dreisaitl. He was flying, eh? Certainly was, and that I don't know if what we're going to see next game, but that was a huge moment, and it gives me hope. Listen, mm -hmm. I don't think the Oilers can win the Stanley Cup if Leon Drysaddle <laughs> doesn't recover from this injury significantly. Right. If <clears throat> he's just you, you can carry Darnell Nurse the way he's playing probably, and still win the Stanley Cup, still get by the Flames. I mean, it's a long way to the Stanley Cup, but you can get by the Flames. Let's put it this way: with if Darnell Nurse plays like he did against LA, but the Oilers need Leon Dreisaitl to be Leon Dreisaitl. He's such a key player on the team. He's the second best player. He's just a fantastic scorer. He's a good. He can be a solid defender. He great faceoff guy. And in the first game, he just really struggled uh, with his defensive chores. But as this game got going on, he started to heat up, and he looked like he was moving very freely on the ice with his skating. So I I'm really encouraged by that. I was hoping yeah. to see that in the first game. It didn't mm -hmm. happen, yeah. but maybe this injury will gradually get better as this series mm -hmm. goes along. Certainly hoping that's the case. So he only had three grade A shots this game, Bruce. So no. But um, <laughs> or three major contributions to grade A shots. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's but that's low for him. That's 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 low for Leon, but they were pretty good ones. Like the the um, it was on the goal second, and two assists on the score sheet that I'm looking at. So <laughs> the second Oilers goal. Um, he made a very nice cross seam pass to Connor McDavid. He didn't mm -hmm. hit him on the stick. He, it was kind of an area pass, but mm -hmm. it went through three. It, he put it right where he wanted to put it. Went through about two or three flames, and um, McDavid got it. And he and McDavid does what he's been doing all s series long. This incredible thing, like it's a next level Connor McDavid, where you think you've got him contained. He hits. He makes contact. He's like Michael Jordan mm -hmm. in the post. You make. He makes contact. And he bounces off and explodes around you. And he and he did this to some extent on this play. Guy flames, guy hits him. McDavid bounces off, puts it to Keith. Keith passes it back to McDavid and goal. The next the next uh, grade A shot, grade A chance from McDavid was early in the third or from Dreisel was early in the third period. And I had been worried about him on the power play, and I think justifiably because he was a lot of pucks were getting out of the offensive zone because he couldn't get there in time. And I was wondering if he could get off his great shot. And he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was able to fire a pretty good executioner shot. Um, pretty good save too. Right? Right? And it was a good save. It wasn't like it wasn't his very best kind of right. shot. It was right at the goalie. Like usually he's pretty good at picking a spot, even with that one timer. But he got it off, and he got it on net. Mm -hmm. And after that, it seemed like he just came alive. And it all culminated in in an absolutely fantastic uh, insurance goal where. Mike Smith made a great stretch pass up the boards to Dreisaitl, who just exploded up the ice, went in and scored a, and, uh, scored a goal on a brilliant shot off the right off the post that Markstrom had no hope on. Ding. Ding indeed. Ding, ding off. off the post, yeah. Ding off. So, Bruce, yeah. I was just, I was, I was uh, wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going on the available information. Oh, well, he you're right like to be concerned. I was right to be concerned. And I, I wasn't saying for sure. It. I was just saying this is this should be a live issue, and I and I mm -hmm. suspect it might be. Mm -hmm. um, but to win, the Oilers needed to play Dreisaitl and hope he comes through, and he did. Mm -hmm. Way to go, Leon Dreisaitl. What a effing great player you are. Yeah, we had a goal and two assists tonight, another goal disallowed. He's up to 7, 8, 15 in the playoffs through, uh, what was this, their ninth game? Yeah. So he's cruising along not too bad for a guy playing on, gimping along on one leg. And he's ill, apparently, Bob Stoffer. Yeah, well, he was ill, yeah. Sick. I don't, we don't know if he's still sick. Right. Like, who knows what that is, but. Okay. Yeah. So, but he was, uh, uh, he was, at, one thing that he does that's just fantastic, he's so good at it, is when he's on the line with McDavid, 
uh what goes into and out of fashion in this town some people like it some people hate it some people like it some of the time hate it the rest of the time uh but what he That's can good. do when he's with mcdavid is find mcdavid with the puck yeah and it'll come to leon and it'll be on his stick for like a quarter <laughs> of a second and he'll do some kind of spin or something and and He'll zing the puck off, and the next thing you know, McDavid's flying up the ice with him. It can be a five-foot pass or 15-foot pass or 75-foot pass. He's capable of all those things. But what he seems most capable of is knowing where Connor's going to be and getting the puck there and uh, giving Connor some, you know, a little bit of time and space to do something with it, which is always a good thing. So It is. It is indeed. I was just thinking as you were talking, I was thinking back to your like your uh, Hyman, your Hyman pick, Bruce. I was trying to like who, he's such an original, ir- like he's a very interesting player. Like he's mm-hmm. so he's a one man wrecking crew on the forecheck. Mm-hmm. Like he just yeah. he he can he yeah. can cycle the puck all by, all by himself. I was like, who who does that? Like who else does that? It's very George George Rock used to do that, but he didn't ever often come out in front and put it in the net like Hyman's yeah. capable of doing from time to time. And, you know, he used to do that way back in the day, uh, and a decent scorer, but not probably on the level of Hyman, was good old Craig McTavish. Yeah, I was thinking he that. He would just grind the the end boards, and he'd do his stops and starts and stops and starts, and, and he had, like, tunnel vision, but when he, when he did get a, a step on a defenseman, he'd take it right to the net and try and bash it in from close range, and you see a lot of that from Hyman. And sometimes it's frustrating because you see an open guy that he could have hit. But uh, he sure does have a nose for the net, and so it's hard to be too critical of that. When you mentioned McTavish, I was uh, it popped in my head. You know, another player who's rounding into a pretty decent third line center before our eyes is Ryan McLeod. He had some very good looks uh, with the puck and was flying all over the ice. He's that close, I think, to starting to put up some points. He's getting very confident, and. Um, High level of skill, big player can really skate, and it's fantastic to see his game come alive. You know, he didn't get it; he wasn't in on any great, great A shots for or against, which is you know not no mistakes. But he was very close a few times. So, Bruce, what is your second good thing among though? Yeah, okay. I'm actually I'm going to uh, go a little bit out of order here, but I'm going to do my bad thing and then my second good thing, and then I'm going to leave you to carry on with your bad thing. Uh, okay. But my bad thing happened first chronologically, so I'm going to go with that. This is the second Calgary goal scored at 6.02 of the first period. Uh, and anytime you look at a score sheet and you see a scoring play, Calgary, Brett Ritchie from Eric Goodbranson and Trevor Lewis. Oh, no. It's an ugly, ugly, ugly goal. I mean, ugly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, Brett Ritchie, and it was like off a of face off, and it took four seconds, uh, of which I think the clock ran one extra second because by two seconds off the draw, uh, Ritchie was all, already on the verge of just tapping at home because I saw a still picture, somebody screen grab. And it just came off a of face off play where both. Uh, Duncan Keith and Evan Bouchard just completely fell asleep at the switch. Uh, Keith went coasting off to the left wing board somewhere, but nowhere near where the pass was going to come from. And Bouchard, I, I, I'm not sure, maybe he was texting his mom or something. I mean, the guy was in behind him and Bouchard's in the slot. And a relatively uh, straightforward shot from Goodbranson comes in and Smith somehow completely loses control of the rebound that goes through him. He doesn't know where it is. And uh, Brett Ritchie picks it up and makes the free deposit into the gaping six by four. Two nothing Calgary, six minutes in. And all but the staunchest diehard Oilers supporter at that moment is going, what are you guys doing for God's sake? You know, same same thing. Two games in a row, down two nothing after six minutes, and ugly goals, both of them really. But that one with the three gray beards uh, all involved in it: Mike Smith, Duncan Keith, and Old Man Bouchard. And they they all look just lost at sea. <clears throat> and so they're going to be my good thing: the the gray beards. And I'm talking about all three guys: Mike Smith, Duncan Keith, and Old Man Bouchard 
who bounced back with a with a pretty strong showing the, the rest of the way, really, uh, with uh, Keith scoring his first goal since he had one goal all year for the Oilers, so he had, and now he's got two, uh, and uh, uh, scoring the uh, first Oilers goal and then getting primary assists on the second and third goal. So I'd say he made up for that defensive blunder and then some. And the assists were, you know, they were good passes in the offensive zone. Uh, and the goal was he jumped, he saw the opportunity develop as the Flames were trying, scrambling to try and contain McDavid, and he jumped up into the box <coughs> office, got a quick shot away, and it uh, found a hole in Jacob Markstrom. And otherwise, I thought, you know, he just was, uh, he just played a pretty, pretty solid game. You're not going to ever get a perfect game out of Duncan Keith at his current age, but uh, he more or less saw it off on shots and, you know, goal two assists plus one on the night. Uh, for his part, old man Bouchard, he scored the tying goal <laughs> on a power play uh, where the Oilers' first unit was unable to, to uh, capitalize. And and Bouchard scored on it, just a howitzer of a slap shot. Like he got a chance to, in the slot where he actually got a little bit of space and he got a chance to really wind up and let fly. And he just ripped the twine with that one. That was a, just a rocket of a shot. And also, again, just I thought his his composure grew as the game went along. After that, that really weird play where he just wasn't doing anything <coughs> in that second goal, and you sort of think, "Where's your head at, man?" Well, his head was firmly in the game from from that point forward. And then finally, the the gray beard of gray beards, forty year old Mike Smith, who had a wretched start for the second game in a row, didn't get pulled. And after allowing two goals and, uh, what, maybe four or five shots in the first six minutes, uh, just one more the rest of the way, uh, he wound up with 37 saves on 40 shots, uh, two more than uh, Jacob Markstrom had on a like number of shots, 40. Uh, obviously, the Oilers did have more higher danger shots. It has to be factored in. But uh, Smith came up with uh, uh, a number of good saves, and he, he dealt with uh, a fair bit of crease crashing that went on in this game. And uh, he uh, uh, he mostly coped with that. I thought not too bad. Uh, and he was finding pucks and rebounds after that ugly second goal. He was doing that better. And then the coup de grace, of course, was that backhand pass. He came out along the goal line and he rifled a backhand. He's got the hardest backhand pass. I mentioned this in a podcast before of any goalie that I've seen. Like he, he just gets some real mustard on a. Like there's a lot of players with sort of normal sticks that can't shoot a backhand near as hard as Mike Smith can, and they can't shoot a backhand to get past the defenseman on the on the other team's point for sure. Well, Smith did that, and it was I think Zadorov that the puck got through, and all of a sudden it's a jailbreak the other way, and and Leon skates onto the puck just as it hits the far blue line, like it worked out to be a perfect stretch pass where you hit the guy at the blue line just as he's coming in and the pass finds him onside and away he goes and away he went and put it away with that perfect shot with uh, Mike Smith getting the primary and only assist on that play. So uh, I guess it's one of those things where, I mean, it sort of speaks to your first good thing of, stuff going horribly wrong at the start of the game, but it's a 60-minute game, and there's time to recover and bounce back. And all three of those players did, uh, in my view, uh, bounce back and wind up with a pretty solid performance for the for the uh, three greatest beards on the, on the team. Yeah, I don't know if Nuge <laughs> has any gray hair, but, man, he was great on the penalty kill, mm-hmm. culminating in that great steal picking off the pass to set up Hyman and get Hyman going there. So yes. and I, I, I'd add that gray beard. I mm-hmm. think Nuge probably has one or two gray hairs, I'm guessing, uh, in his scrawny mustache. Um, he is such a great penalty killer, Bruce, Ryan Nugent Hopkins. And we were just remarking, like you you remarked that when the Flames scored, he was in the penalty box. And we think it wasn't last game, but the game before that same thing happened. He's, he's the order's best penalty killer. And... Um, Sure came up with a huge play tonight, you know, kicking off that that uh, Hyman goal. I'm not sure if he was in the box. He was responsible for the penalty. Eh? It was a too many men penalty where he oh, played okay. the puck instead of going off. But that's a team <clears> penalty. <throat> okay. So they likely, I, I, 
don't have right in front of me who served right, well, I do yeah. know he wasn't on the ice when the goal was scored. That was there scored against the uh, McLeod Yamamoto yeah. uh, unit. But, uh, uh, yeah, he's been, uh, uh, that's been uh, one of the strongest parts of his game for sure has been on the PK. This year he's found up. offense on the PK. Like he's yeah. really started to score goals and assists shorthanded and, and really for most of his career, there was hardly any of that. So... I really love how he's playing in the playoffs and make, you know, make, you know, cause I think both Nuge and McDavid haven't been great in the playoffs in the past. Nuge was really good in game four against Winnipeg. It was the, f- the first time I saw him really come alive and bring his a game in the playoffs. And, and he's doing it this year consistently. And I know maybe not even ever, I don't know what his course is. I think there's some people who like there's, that might be a little bit of an issue for some people, but I think he's really playing well. And I, I think he's really digging in there, battling and uh, hitting people, winning pucks, winning puck battles, and playing strong defensive hockey. Bruce, um, let's he, go he did, for. He did have head. a very rough game one, but he was far from the only Oiler. Yeah. Who did? I mean, game one. Game one. What a ball Coming ball. home with the split, baby. That's all that matters out of that. After that so disaster, that baby. <laughs> mm. All right. Um, bad things, Bruce. My bad thing this and the ref i feel sorry like i can feel a little bit um sympathetic for chris lee although i tweeted it after the first period that he should be shot into the sun um i i feel a little, because he it was he was an equal opportunity screw up artist tonight but man he must yeah, he feel bad Calgary in the end too, he, he totally screwed up on two balls i don't think there's any way to put it these were both free pucks and he blew the whistle too quick both times mm-hmm. and called off goals that shouldn't have been called off. In the end, it it um, it, it uh, evens out for both teams, which is I'm thankful for. But man, you can't. I don't know what kind of mistake why he was doing that, but that doesn't strike me as being textbook NHL quality refereeing. Mm-hmm. And he might have been playoff nerves. I don't know. Like people are just saying be in the right position or until you're sure that it's stopped, don't blow the whistle. Cause you could always, I guess, call off the goal later on yeah. the review. That's my issue. So be why more are you doing patient. that? Yeah. Be a bit more patient. You can call it off if it later you have mm-hmm. that opportunity, but you're kind of deciding the outcome. Cause if you blow the whistle, mm-hmm. there's no, it's done. Yeah. If, you, if you have it wrong, it's over. Yeah. So he seems like he was just a little, um, out of position and nervous, nervous nellying it, and he screwed up twice in a, in a really significant way. So I feel I feel bad for the guy. I'm sure he feels terrible about this. I don't I don't know. Like that would be my guess that he's feeling terrible about these two calls when he sees them again. So, uh, but nonetheless, these were major mistakes in a really big game, and they could have cost one of the teams the game. At least it even out. For a long time, we were looking at just the one Edmonton goal that was cancelled, and Edmonton was looking at a one-goal deficit for most of that time. Yeah. And it was, <clears throat> it was looming pretty pretty big for quite a long while, but then uh, uh, Edmonton got back in the game on, on level terms, and then he made a similar mistake against Calgary. Uh, my take is that if you're the referee and you think the goalie has the puck, wait a second. If he has the puck, he's probably still going to have the puck. If he doesn't yeah. have the puck and the other team bangs it in, well, by not blowing the whistle, you've given him that chance. And if it turns out he had the puck and somebody, you know, is, is bashing him and digging it out or pushing him into the net or something, you have replay to look at all that stuff. You don't have to sort of make the assumption that, well, he put his glove down, therefore the puck must be under it because it's a shell game. The puck could be anywhere. Uh, and some of these scrambles and... and Anyway, he, he the, my, my complaint, uh, really on both, although I was not complaining about the second one, to be honest, uh, but my, my, my issue on both of them was the whistle was too quick. Yeah. You know, Here's you can't tweet. see the puck. Well, you got two refs, right? Do they both have to lose the sight of the puck before they blow the whistle? Or yeah. Now you got two refs, and if either of them lose the sight of the puck, he can blow the whistle. I don't see how that improves things. He had a real pain look on his face when he blew off that second one. Like he looked, he, he didn't look like happy to be making that call, but I guess he had to. Here's a tweet from Rob Safarian McGuire at Rob McGuire. Referee Chris Lee might be the only person in Alberta with a lower approval rating than Jason Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. 
Ouch. Indeed. Okay. Um, well, they did manage to uh, equal opportunity uh, piss off of both teams. So in the end, I mean, it comes out in the wash, I guess. Well, that's what Oilers fans will say right now because our team won the game, but mm-hmm. Flames fans will say yeah. they were up. Bruce, um, what is your bad thing? Are you, uh, yeah. Oh, I already gave my bad thing. Oh, you already, that's right. You worked yeah. it in there on Keith. Yeah, I did. Okay. So my number, well, I'm going to, I'm going to skate. Go to your right, number. I'm going to skate right past the 439 of ice time for Josh Archibald and the 417 for Zach Cassian, who played their way uh, right out of this game. Uh, but I'm going to go to the number 13 just because I heard this stat today and it was just so unbelievable uh, that Calgary has now lost in game two. They've lost game two of their last 13 playoff series. They're 0 and 13 in games two of their last 13 playoffs. 0 and 13. <laughs> I, mean, the, I mean, the odds of that, if it was a coin flip, uh, the odds of it are like 8,000 to 1. Like, wow. it just can't happen, you know? And, I mean, sometimes they're the favorite, sometimes they're the underdog, sometimes they're home, sometimes they're the road, of course. But uh, after 13 games, you think, anyway, so... And they almost, in the third period, looked like a team that knew it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I really thought Calgary did not have a, lot, a great amount of pushback in the third period, and that Edmonton actually uh, was the predominant club even as Calgary had a few power plays and more shots in the third, but uh, uh, I didn't see them as a team with the more belief in that they were going to pull out the win. And maybe they, maybe this, some would call it a jinx. I hate that word, but what there's this, this uh, inability to get the job done in game two, for whatever reason, it's usually a pretty crucial game in a series though. And it's uh, looking that way in this one. So, Oh, and 13. Yeah, I can't let that one go. <laughs> okay, uh, Bruce, my number. So like, give me a second here because I want to give credit. I want to find it. So, uh, 5 and 11, yeah. It's by way of uh, our uh, sometimes cult of hockey contributor, Ira Cooper. Mm-hmm. Um, original Pusar, uh, original Posar on Twitter. Yeah. And he points out that the Jacob Markstrom um, has led in 13 goals in the two games. Now only 11 of them have counted, but 11 goals in two mm-hmm. games. Now the legend of Jacob Markstrom is way hardcore. Like we were, we were heading into this series thinking, yeah. you know, we're, we're facing Dominic Hasek in his prime here. And he is a very, very good goalie, but he's, he has struggled so far. And I don't, I like, I'm not saying that's going to continue, he can mm-hmm. easily come up with a, a couple big games and steal some games for the Calgary Flames. So I'm not jinxing the Oilers here or by um, um, talking down about Markstrom, but he has he hasn't brought his A game yet. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to suggest against the Oilers that I, I'm surprised. I thought I you know I was thinking man the Oilers are going to struggle to score against this guy yeah. because he's so big and he can be he can be so good sometimes struggles with his puck handling when he gets like Koskinen when he gets out of that it's a it's a it can be kind of a, an adventure but um yeah he hasn't brought his a game yet now part of this is the Oilers are getting some really great chances like especially this game you know 10 five alarm chances you, you know you get 10 five alarm chances you're going to get three goals from that on average um just right there so that's the expectation. So he's he's facing some tough shots, but um, the Oilers um, they're getting to him, and I like it. I like it. So hopefully this trend continues. I don't know if it will. I don't, actually don't expect it will. Yeah. I expect Markstrom to come up big, mm-hmm. but um, Mike Smith is so far. Well, he got pulled the first game, but. Yeah. Tonight, Mike Smith was the better goalie. I hung in with him tonight, and it turned out to be the right decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mark's from, as you say, as original pose are high, uh, as he says, uh, uh, he's got, he got beaten six <clears throat> times in game one, seven times tonight, but two went back on the board, and they, we didn't wind up recording them as grade A shots because yeah. those plays didn't happen. Yeah. Right, rebound, uh, the rebound goal that Leon had that was disallowed, which, by the way, I thought was the right call uh, on the goaltender interference call. I, I agree that probably was uh, the right call. 
Yeah. And the, uh, I mean, I was mad. Uh, McDavid, McDavid had nowhere to go, but uh, he, if he goes through the blue paint and moves the goalie and the guy slams the rebound in where the goalie used to be, I mean, that's goalie interference to me. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it wasn't deliberate. It doesn't have to be. It just has to yeah. be what. If you allow that play by mm-hmm. McDavid, Bruce, the, the NHL players start looking for that play, right? They'll just keep doing it. Mm-hmm. So you can't allow you can't allow that goal. Glenn Anderson will come out of retirement, <laughs> Dave. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, and the other, uh, uh, but when he made it, he made a couple of sharp saves early when it was two nothing, and I'm going, oh no, it's going to be a long uphill climb to get even two on this guy, even if Smith, you know figures it out and slams the door that two goal deficit's looking big but it uh they chipped away and at that it was uh uh three to one early in the second uh before the orders finally started to uh uh they came back with the next four straight goals so two games in a row the orders scored four in a row i have to so. say the goals if you look at the goals that went in bruce mm-hmm. so the mcdavid goal was a brilliant deke. Now, you, you think the goalie might possibly have that one, but okay, Bouchard slap shot. I mean, who's going to stop that? It's just like he's got one of the best shots in the league. He's coming right down the middle of the slot. It's a mm-hmm. very hard play. Hyman's goal perfectly placed. Dry Saddle's shot perfectly placed. On breakaways. So the only one that you think, and Keith. this was actually a pretty crucial moment, maybe the Keith goal was a little. Mm-hmm. Where you want to save from your goalie, it was it was yeah. a very difficult shot because it's um it's the old low high pass, mm-hmm. you know McDavid passing it from low to high and, and to Keith and there's a one timer shot, very difficult play in a lot of ways, but maybe that would be the only one. But even that was a very hard shot. So all the goals that got by him were great shots. I think we had mm-hmm. them all as five alarm shots. Yeah, we did, except for Bouchard's because it was a little outside of the yeah. uh, area. <laughs> so, pretty tough. The orders are making some great shots, I guess is my point. So, you can't... He, Markstrom was actually worse in the first game than he was in this one. Well, Sutter, uh, Darryl Sutter made the point in the pregame. He said that they were talking about team defense, and he said, well, by our numbers, uh, uh, we held Edmonton to 12 scoring chances in the first game. And, I mean, our own count had him at 10, so we're yeah. not too far wrong. And he said, and they got six goals. He said, that speaks to how good they are at uh, execution. So we really have to focus on keeping those numbers low. And uh, his concern was, well, give Edmonton a chance, they're going to put the puck in the net more often than, than an average team. And, uh, that's a legit viewpoint. Too legit to quit. All right, Bruce, I think, uh, I think that's a wrap. I think we've gone through the. Uh, do you have any other thoughts or anything you'd like to add? Or uh, Kurt picked up the grades tonight after being winded out in uh, game one. You you picked up uh, for him, so he uh, he got the better of that deal. Yeah, and I've he, got. He all already apologized so to you. He's already yeah. apologized. <laughs> I'm glad I did not. Know. For the windstorm on Pender Island that knocked out the power. Yeah. But uh, we'll we'll see what he has to say. But uh, uh, I think. You and I have said what we're going to say, so maybe we should uh, call it a night. Bruce, thanks for talking tonight. Right. Thanks for listening, everyone. In the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.